via telephone, financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We're doing great. Hey, before we get into finance, let's talk football. Tyson Bagent gets his first career start, and the Bears snap a huge losing streak, go on to get a win, 30-12, uh, to 12, in fact, over the Raiders. Bagent was uh, flawless, uh, had a rating near 100, didn't throw any picks, had a touchdown pass, a touchdown run, uh, had a huge first down run to convert uh, a third and 11, and looked very comfortable running that offense, Phil. Yes, he did. It was what a good football weekend it was. With I watched every second of Bay. Just the most football I think I've watched in a long time. But it was, you know, it was more so than, you know, just efficiency. Look at what he did on third down. Which you all, a lot of people say that third down dictates the game. Who wins third down wins the game. And every third down that they had, it seemed like he came up with a play. Whether it was checking down to the right receiver or running it himself, he he played unbelievable. I hope he gets a chance to play next Sunday night. I think he's a better quarterback in Chicago, and I don't know if it'll play out to where they keep letting him play because Justin Fields a first round pick. But man, he looked good. I was I was excited to see that. That was that was fun to watch for sure. They I think they set up a great plan for him. He did, he only averaged five and a half yards of pass attempt, which is very low. It, it tells you that they're asking him to manage the game and don't try to win it on your own. But the Bears' running game was so good, he didn't have to go downfield too much and risk anything. I thought that they played that very smart with him. Yeah, well, yeah and, and, and those and those were check down passes. So if there's no one open, that tells you that he's going through his progression, which is huge for a rookie quarterback. I'm no quarterback coach or anything, but when you're looking down and he, had, and he kept his eyes down the field when he got pressured and he found the open receiver, and that's what you want your quarterback to do. I wish Kenny Pickett would always do that instead of uh, them just throwing screens. But that was that was a good-looking uh, game from, from his standpoint. He made big plays when he needed to make big plays, and they blew him out, man. For Chicago to blow anybody out, uh, that, that's that's pretty big. And you know, that's yeah, it's the Raiders, but the Raiders were three and three. The Raiders wasn't a bad team, and they hung thirty on them and and kept the ball seemingly the entire game, man. It was like three, four, five yards six yards seven yards here and there and, and they just they kept the ball what seemed like to be the entire game it was, it was a good performance very good performance bill you you were ready to say something over there no i'm not sure i i uh i could not watch the game but i followed on my ipad and uh, so i i'm seeing it from a statistical point of view perspective and from statistic wise he looked good 21 to 29, 162, 24 yards rushing. He he did what was required to win, but he just looked so comfortable back there. You're like the moment was not too big for him, right? No, not at all. You know, I, I was a little bit annoyed at Mark Sanchez and the announcers. You know, at some point, and I'm glad that Shepard got some recognition, but they, you know, he they acted as if he came from. Um, in, in a third world country somewhere, and, and it's it's not a surprise. Shepard's got players that that has been to the NFL, that's on, that had been on NFL rosters before, so it's not a shock. So to give Shepard their credit instead of acting like it's such a gigantic shock that there's someone from well, Phil, Shepard it is though. Made the NFL. You're talking it about is not. You're, you're talking it's about a guy. These, I mean, he was a Division two quarterback last year, and he's starting an NFL game this year, his rookie season. That's unusual, Phil. I know. Well, it is unusual. Make mention of it, though, but that was like the headline. He couldn't complete a five-yard pass without some sort of mention of, oh, he's from <laughs> Little Division II Shepherd well, College or Shepherd <laughs> University. And, I mean, you got to let it go eventually and, you know, give give the kid his credit and and give Shepherd their credit. They've got players in the NFL, but it's you know, it, it just got old. My wife thought the same thing. She's like, my goodness, it's the fourth quarter. Let's talk about Tyson Bajan. Instead of what a shock it is that he came from Shepherd, yeah, it is a surprise. He was playing Division Two, he was an undrafted free agent. He made the team, at, yes, and, and let it go in the fourth quarter. And let's talk about his play instead of what a big shock it was that he was there. That's all I'm saying. All right, we disagree on that. I, I think that they they gave that the hype it deserved, man. But that's all right. We're allowed to disagree. Now, one thing we agree on is that yesterday in the second half, the Steelers looked like they actually had an NFL offense. They did, and they're four and two, and it's hard to complain about how bad they. Because I, I, you know, that first half, their offense looked like it has always looked all season long. But when push comes to shove, and that's kind of been Kenny Pickett his his entire career so far, is when push comes to shove and it's tight, 
he comes up big, and that, that offense did look pretty good in the fourth quarter with uh, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren was running well. Deontay Johnson made an appearance. We hadn't seen him all year because of an injury. Uh, George Pickens, they made two boneheaded, we got two boneheaded 15-yard penalties, but but they uh, they played well. So and that was a pretty good team that they beat on the road. They had to tra- travel time zones, which you know doesn't, doesn't get talked about a lot. But when you have to travel time zones, that's a tough on those guys. So to pull out that win, now they got Jacksonville next week. If they can win that one. That's a, that's a great start to the season. Yeah, why is it always wide receivers? Why why are wide receivers always such mercurial, brain dead idiots when it comes to common <laughs> sense? Think, you know, the, the one with the Deontay Johnson, it was unnecessary, but I thought it was a little harsh to get a penalty in that point. He just did the hush sign, you know. He did. He told him to shut up, or you know, did his little sign, and, and I, I thought that was a little harsh for a fifteen yard penalty for that, especially when. That that would have essentially ended the game, but uh, but still it was unnecessary. And and uh, Pickens, made, which he does that quite often. Pickens had one not long before that, and then Deontay Johnson. That's kind of out of his character. I don't think he's done things like that that much. And you could and I, you know what I liked about that though was Pickett lost his mind when when Pickens got his 15 yard penalty. He lost his mind on that, and he should have. And that showed a little bit of leadership, but. Four and two, man. I was I was pleased with the win. It didn't look good going into half, but uh, but I was pleased with the win. I think they should do a maturity test, Bill, during the combines for for wide receivers. Like give them a lollipop and then like take it away from them right away, like you do with your four year old, yeah. you know, and see how upset that they get. That and, and that should tell you something well, about what, them. That's that and the right tackles. The right tackles seem to get their share of penalties as well. Right, no one loves hey, the right hey. tackle. He's talking about me, I think. <laughs> hey, <laughs> going back to going back to the emergence of the uh, of the Steelers in the second half, I assume that was due to Matt Can- Canada, was it? He's the offensive coordinator. Yes, it was. It was in spite of Matt Canada, probably. <laughs> but they did throw the ball down the field a little bit. You know, instead of just dink and dunk and throwing it, throwing a, uh, a wide receiver screen on third and fourteen, they actually tried to advance the ball. Instead of let's just hold it for hold the ball for three plays and give our defense a small rest and put them back out there, but uh, yeah, I guess the the heat will be off of him a little bit uh, for this week. But you know, it is kind of sad they put up 24 points and we're ecstatic. We are that they put up the league they, that they put up the league average <laughs> points. We're, we're tickled to death about it. <laughs> little, little victories, Phil. That little victories. State of off, uh, Pittsburgh's offense. One of our, uh, our contributors, uh, Parker Darlington, mentioned uh, Brenton Doyle, uh, who plays for the Rockets, also from Shepard, and he's having a fantastic year as well. Yeah, he's a yeah, baseball I mean, player. Shepard guys in, in the professional professional mm-hmm. levels from Shepard, and, and it's uh, you know there, there's been a, there's been a handful. Of, and I can't really you know Brown and and James Roos way back in the late '90s, back when I was playing. There's been a lot of guys out there. That's not Alabama. I'm not trying to make that case, but they're uh, as far as Division Two is concerned. And they said at one point, 99.9 percent of the country wouldn't know that Shepherd University existed. And I kind of debate that a little bit too. They've been into the national, their Division Two power. They haven't won the national championship, but they're, they've been there in, in the in the semifinals and the quarterfinals and the playoffs year after year after year. They don't talk that way about. Grand Valley State and Saginaw and some of those other schools, and Shepherd's had just as much success as they have. Well, I, I guarantee you, ninety-nine percent of the country can't spell Shepherd's Town correctly. I know that for a fact. Well, S H E P P A R D S T O W N. Shepard. It gets Shepard mangled, man. Town, yeah. Hey, let's talk money. Uh, this is not a great environment for stock market investing right now, Phil. We've got the uh, 5% uh, treasury bond. We've got uh, war in the Middle East, uh, Ukraine, Russia, high interest rates, inflation, all that stuff cooking up uh, a terrible stew there for the markets. Well, it, and it, it, I guess it depends on where you're looking at it, whether it's a, a good place for investment or not, because last week was so bad. And that old saying, buy low, sell high, sort of comes in. But what we thought was going to happen last week most certainly didn't happen. And I was hopeful that corporate earnings would overtake the headlines, and that would be what moved the market. And it didn't, although that the ones that reported exceeded the expectations. And that that's a good thing that we can allow to be a good thing. 
but this week we have some of the tech giants that are going to report. So I'm hoping again, I've, I'm rejuvenated after the weekend and hoping again that some maybe that the earnings, the corporate earnings will overtake what the, the economic data that we want to be bad so our markets can go up. I hate that narrative, but it is accurate. And so that's why I'm, I'm hopeful. And they're spread out throughout the week, so it's not all coming in one day. But uh, I think it's Microsoft and Google and Facebook. They're all reporting this week. And, and there's a bunch of earnings coming out. It's not just the tech jobs, but they'll, they will get the, the headline simply because of their size. And, of course, we'll, we'll continue. Hopefully it's in the background. But we'll continue with the bond yields and the Federal Reserve and what's going to happen at the next meeting and the first print for the GDP and and all of that stuff. And in normal environment, that economic data that that we receive, I don't necessarily dislike it. I just hate the narrative and because it is true. I hate the narrative that we need to see it suffer a little bit so our markets can improve. I hate looking at that thinking, oh, I want this to be softer than what we expected or worse than what we expected so that our markets can rally some. And, and, and eventually we're going to see that. And that's where I kind of find uh, some peace in, in this whole battle against inflation is, you know, it seems like a never-ending battle. But I assure you that and whether we, we like it or not, the Federal Reserve will win that battle. They will get inflation down to whatever target they, they've deemed, which right now it's 2%. And to John and I's dismay, they, they seem unwilling to come off of that number. But they will get that down there no matter what they have to do, no matter how long they have to keep rates high or how much they have to increase it. And once that occurs, the higher the rates are, the easier it's going to be able to dig out of economic pain when it does happen, whether it's on the jobs front or consumer spending or whatever it may be, the easier it will be able to dig out because they'll have more room for rate drops. And that's an easier fix than uh, bringing down inflation and and look to the example of April 2020 compared to 22 and 23, how long it's taken and how hard of a fight it has been to bring down inflation. But in April of 2020, when rates came down drastically, when rates came down quick and and what it did for our markets, that was a fairly easy fix. And now that we're trying to repair that, but so I do look forward to that time where, our, our economic environment softens a little bit in the federal in the conversation can be are there is there going to be a rate cut and that's when most asset classes if not all asset classes especially those bonds that you know our conservative investors are so heavy in that's when those bonds will rally so it's times like this where you look at your bond portion of your portfolio and I'm guilty of it as well and think well why do we even have money in here man it has struggled so bad in 22 and 23, and it's supposed to be the opposite of equities and kind of keep us afloat. And it still it does. You know, the downside of bonds isn't as bad as the downside of equities, but also the upside of bonds isn't as, as good as the upside of equities. But I'll reference April of 2020 yet again. And if you can just shorten that window from April, May, and June and look at bond performance when rates were going down, we could be heading into an environment we just don't know when. But we'll be heading into an environment where that, that's possible again, where our bonds can rally. So I do look forward to that time um, that where, where the Federal Reserve then, and instead of the conversation, will there be a rate increase, the conversation changes to will there be a rate decrease. Yeah. Uh, Phil, last week, you're right, was, a, uh, uh, was very, very disappointing. Uh, yet, and I'm having trouble understanding why. Uh, the earnings were kind of mixed. Uh, Tesla was uh, a not good earnings, but Netflix uh, far exceeded theirs. Uh, you you continually remind us that earnings is kind of a key. But last week, I think, runs in opposition to that. Uh, inflation should have been discounted to some degree. What was the reason? Can you pinpoint one reason? Was it the Middle East or what was it that we had such a disaster no, this week? It, it it became the the narrative became last week something I hoped that it wouldn't, but you're right where Tesla did struggle. Tesla did struggle some, but most of those reporting the companies reporting did exceed expectations. And, and you're right, it did run counterintuitive to what we had thought would happen, which is another reason why we don't try to time the markets. But the reason for last week, some of it was the Middle East, just a simple fear from the Middle East. 
But when the consumer confidence and consumer data can retail spending came out, it they blew it out of the water with what the expectations were. So what we had seen was, and, and we've said this before, right now we still have a consumer that complains about high prices. They complain about how much things cost, but they still do it. So we're complaining about it, but not doing anything about it. You know, I complain about Ada not cleaning her room, but I've yet to punish her for it. So I'm complaining about it, but I'm not doing anything about it, which is probably why her room has been so dirty of late, because <laughs> our complaints doesn't result in anything. Not yet, Ada, if you're listening. It's, it's coming. I'm I sure could, she's still I, yeah. I could hear her eye roll from here. <laughs> yeah, in a huff, yeah. But, but, I'm sure. Uh, she'll, she'll get it. She'll get it. It's, it's, I've given her some slack because it's been a busy time with volleyball and all that's going on. So we, it's not. It's mother is is more likely to punish her for that than yeah. I am. But that is how our consumers have been of late. We're but, we're complaining about it, but we're not doing anything about well, it. Well, that's I guess it's, I'm asking for more persistivity than anybody's uh, prepared to give. But your answer is kind of a soft answer. Uh, that does not give me a sense of did we see something last week that we have not seen in the very recent past or that we do not anticipate to see in the co- weeks coming? Yeah, it, it was it was exactly that. It was consumer spending. It was the retail spending. And what we didn't expect was it for to be as high as it was. And we expected it to come in at an increase of 0.3, I think, and it came in at 0.7. So it doubled what expectations were, and that was a shock, and that was something that we didn't expect. You're right in in terms of the consumer has been strong all through this battle with inflation, but to the, the strength that it showed at that last report was way above what we had thought, and that is exactly what spooked the markets last week and made us ignore the majority or most of the companies reporting, Tesla not one of them, but most of the companies reporting had exceeded their expectations on the bottom line, and and which can be a good thing if we allow it. But last week we didn't allow it because of the strength of the consumer, which again pushes the Federal Reserve to, to consider increasing rates, and maybe not in November, but in December, but still the underlying narrative that they'll keep them higher for longer because of the strength of the consumer. You know, Phil, you, you've, rewired my, you've rewired my brain. I used to read the Wall Street Journal and think news like in today's that uh, Goldman Sachs is increasing their uh, annual, the, the growth rate for the economy from their previous 3.7 to now 4.4% uh, annual rate. And I read that now and I think, oh, crap. So now, you know, we're going to we're going to continue <laughs> on on this rate. And then I also in today's journal, it's, um, it's the worst time ever to buy a house. Apparently, the average mortgage is now 52 percent higher in America than the average uh, uh, rent payment. And you also show that the average income among whites in the United States has increased only by 1%, 1.1%, but for blacks and Hispanics, it's gone down by more than that for each of them. So I don't know, there, there seems to be such a mixed message here. While we, we've got the economy that's, that's thriving, we've got the inflation that's going, we've got the, the um, mortgage rates that are skyrocketing, and then the Fed's going to do what the Fed's going to do. I don't understand how we turn this corner because right by any other estimation before I started talking to you and you've ruined my days, I used to look at all of this <laughs> as, as you know, great positive stuff about, about the thriving economy. But once we, we create an economy that's not thriving, that's not going to help the folks who have already had lower, uh, already seen their, their disposable income decrease. So then what happens? I mean, how do we, how do we turn it back around after we've broken it again? Well, once it once it breaks or or cracks, hopefully it cracks instead of breaking. But once those 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 underlying data points uh, crack, the Federal Reserve has at its its disposal to reduce interest rates to then pump our economy back up, and that's where our markets would also respond uh, uh, to. So that, that's what we were talking about earlier. The higher the rates go the easier it's going to be to fix any cracks that w- that we start to see, assuming that inflation gets down to where they want it to be. And that leads back to what you and I had talked about before, is I just wish they would change that target just a little bit so that we can get down to that and allow our economy to hum 
without doing too much damage to it. And it's not as if, you know, mo- most of what you had just mentioned were were pretty decent things, you know, that, that, that we have a strong consumer, but mortgages is way more expensive. We see it here. We've got a lot of clients that were considering buying a home and they didn't, and now it's just out of the question or, or it's just a wait and see. Now, we have someone living in a RV out west. It's just kind of cool what they're doing but they waited a little bit too long and now they're paying the price for it because of the interest rates and how much this stuff costs. But eventually that will come back down and that will come back down once the Federal Reserve starts to see some of these data points uh, soften, especially on the jobs front and, and unemployment numbers tick back up. It doesn't have to break. They just want it to crack. If it cracks, that's a soft landing. If it breaks, that's a recession. And when the time comes that I think it's kind of inevitable at this point that we start replenishing our uh, munitions in the United States because we're we're using them elsewhere, but we're going we're depleting a lot of them. So we start making more missiles and bombs and, and and guns and bullets. Does that contribute to the inflation or do we assume that since it's already within the the budget, the military budget, that it's it's just a a wash? Uh, that that should be a wash when, once we start using it here at, at home again, and that would be a sector pickup. So if you think of some of these defense companies like Northrop Grumman and some of those, that, that's when they'll probably increase in value or have the potential to increase in value uh, once that occurs. But it should have very small impact because the money's being spent. It's just not being sent here at home. So I don't think that that would be that much of a headwind to inflation. Financial Phil, just uh, about uh, out of time here with you, Phil. So uh, the question is this, Phil. We get you go through an inflationary period where a box of cereal that used to be $4 is now $6. As inflation cools down, does the cereal go back down to $5, or do we just get used to no. it not going up to $7? No. No, and it doesn't because of shrinkflation. A lot of those companies, and I, I love that word, but uh, a lot of those companies and a lot of those products, Instead of just increasing their prices beyond belief, they just gave us less. And once they gave us less, now they don't have to uh, decrease their prices when inflation starts to come back down, and they'll continue to give us less. Their serving size will be smaller. We may start to see some some boxes that say 25% more or things of that nature, but that shrinkflation, it, it typically sticks and it stays in our grocery stores, especially on pre-packaged types of food like cold cereal and and granola bars and things of that nature, breakfast foods, that stuff typically stays. I remember um, Carnation Instant Breakfast used to be a big thing for my brother and I when we were growing up. When mom bought it, we were so happy, and it was packs of 12. And I think, I I could be wrong because we don't buy it anymore, but when I was at the store the other day, I think I saw the box, and it was a pack of eight, I think. It was a variety pack. But I do remember when mom would get the pack of 12 and we would fight over the strawberry because they didn't have individual strawberries. Now, I don't know. I want to tell them, like, hey, you got to get some carnation instant breakfast to see how many strawberries are in there. But I think it was a pack of six. It was a pack of six or eight. And when it used to be when we were growing up, it was a pack of 12. And that's all a result, a result of shrinkflation. We'll call that the, the next economic indicator. The uh, Phil shrinkflation indicator is carnation instant breakfast strawberries. Carnation. Carnation Instant Breakfast, how many strawberries are in the variety pack? (laughs) That was a big deal to us. That's the test right there, baby. (laughs) Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. You have a great day. Thank you, guys.